Hello and welcome to the Regional Print Centre's series of YouTube videos, Printmaker's Studio. We kick off the series with a day spent with the wonderful Julia Midgley. She's in a Cheshire studio working on a new etching plate. It was a real privilege spending the day with Julia and being able to record her process. Viewers, you're in for a real treat, so sit back and enjoy. Hello, I'm Julie Mitchley. Um, I'm an artist, printmaker, and um, I'm going to talk today about an etching uh, plate that I'm developing, and we'll show you the process of taking it through um, the various stages of production into a print. Uh, eventually, whether we'll get it all done in one day, I don't know, but eventually it will be editioned and um, probably have some colour in it, although I'm not a great colourist with etching, I rely much more heavily on my drawing rather than being a colourist. So if I was a colourist I'd probably do silk screen and um, I'm not a colourist, I'm a drawer so I tend to be more monochrome in my printmaking. So um, what I have done is there are a few drawings uh, that I've done recently that I think will make good material on an etching. Um, I'll show you those in a minute but um, from the very first stages of preparing an etching plate. Um, I use zinc rather than copper and the reason I use zinc uh, is, is just historically when I first started printmaking my studio was in the basement of our house and our children were young and toddlers and the chemicals you need for copper are much more toxic and noxious than the chemicals you use for uh, zinc which is uh, nitric acid diluted in water. So um, this is a, an example of a, a zinc plate. It comes with a black plastic uh, peel-off cover to protect it. And it also comes with a painted back on it, which just saves you a lot of time and trouble uh, varnishing it out. It protects it in the acid on the back of the plate. Um, to prepare the plate for uh, the first stage of etching, I'm a very traditional etcher, so I don't um, do very much experimental work with my uh, images. It's mainly, I start with a line and literally do the drawing directly onto the plate. And I don't bother with drawing the image back to front, which a lot of artists do. But if, if I did that, my brain would scramble totally, so I just draw the image. And I'm usually reasonably happy with the resulting output from the press, albeit in reverse. Um, so long as I'm happy with the composition as drawn on the plate, then I know I'll be fairly happy with it just when it's reversed as a mirror image. After all, a, an etching, when it's been through the plate, is, is you put the paper on the print and it comes off and it's the same really as a potato cut. You know, it's, there you are, a mirror image on the finished piece of paper. So to prepare this plate uh, properly and traditionally, the first thing I had to do was to take my um, trusty broken <laughs> file and file around the edges, removing this as I go, and particularly on the corner, because when this edge goes through the etching press, the etching press has a lot of pressure on it. And the paper is dampened before use, but even so, if I didn't file and bevel off these edges, the plate would cut the paper as it went through the press. So the first thing you do is remove any sharp edges, and you go all the way around, and particularly at the corners. Um, once you've done that and you're satisfied it's um, not going to cut through your paper, and printmaking paper is quite thick and pretty tough anyway. But nevertheless, um, that's an important stage. The next stage is to reach for your brasso. And you just have to polish the plate to get rid of any uh, slight surface imperfections. And you'd be amazed that once you've polished that plate, it comes up like a mirror. And you have to, you know, I, I sort of put the brasso on, rub it off, and then it still needs more, and you can carry on and carry on for ages until your rubbing cloth is quite clean. 
And after that, because the brasso has an element of greasiness in it, you then make a mixture of French chalk and ammonia. The ammonia is dampened, uh, sorry, diluted. Uh, I dilute it 20 parts of water to one of ammonia. And I pour it into French chalk and make this paste. The paste is then rubbed all over the surface of this newly polished etching plate and then washed off. And you put it under a quite a powerful spray of water and once the water runs off the surface of the plate without breaking anywhere, you know how if there's a greasy spot, the water will break apart and go around the grease. You don't want to have any grease left on the surface of the plate. If you do have any grease left, the protective varnish you place on it in the areas you do not want the acid to bite will, or could, come away and then that would ruin your image or could ruin your image. So this is um, really a very important part of the very first stage of an etching plate, is cleaning it and cleaning it and cleaning it and then degreasing it and degreasing it and degreasing it. Okay, so now my plate has been thoroughly degreased and polished. And what it now needs for the first line stage, line drawing stage, is to be coated with um, what's called a, a hard ground. This is a dark wax, and this is a piece of the dark wax. They come in little, little boxes like this as a round disc, but mine's been used quite a lot, um, so I have different... Must have, they just break off and... Um, Obviously, though, because it's so hard, I can't just spread it on like that. The plate has to be hot, and this is my very high-tech grill that I place over just a traditional gas flame, but, um, you know, you could use any high heat that you've got available, or in a proper professional print workshop, you'd have a hot plate. I have a hot plate, but it's only a plate warmer hot plate, it doesn't get to hot enough temperature. So here I am, I'm just heating the plate up, and as it heats, you see I can now start to move the wax around on the surface. Try and do it without burning fingers. And then while it's still hot, so here, and this is a, a gelatine roller, but I use this one for um, applying the wax. You see? By rolling it like that, I'll have a nice surface on there. And all that now needs to do is cool down before I draw on it. So, uh, in the best of traditions, here's one I prepared earlier. And this is a slightly larger plate, but you can see clearly the brown wax. And um, hopefully you can see the drawing that I've put on it. Um, just briefly, the drawing itself is based on a real drawing I was doing of... Um, an online contemporary dance session. This is the drawing here. Um, and I did think when I did it, it was quite like a print. It, it actually, I think it would make a very good woodcut, but as I'm not a woodcutter, um, I'm going to turn it into an etching. <laughs> um, but I, the, the proportions of that image were not quite the proportions I had in mind for my print. So... I sort of drew around the plate I had and loosely drew these same three figures again. He was dancing with a long swathe of fabric, but what I quite liked about that was the idea that people are connected, you know, it's like a connection between three figures. But they didn't quite fill the space properly, and I wanted a somehow this, I quite like this stripy background, which I achieved on a drawing using a homemade thick paper brush 
And I haven't used this on an etching plate before, but I will do it when we come to the aquatint stage, which I'll explain then. But um, I'm hoping to be able to brush straw hat varnish across and, and achieve the same effect. I also felt it needed some extra images around the figures, but I wasn't quite sure what, other than the fact I wanted to include this figure, who is um, a young contemporary dancer from uh, Taiwan, or I can't remember, certainly an eastern country, and she wore this wonderful kimono that made her look rather butterfly-like, and with her two pom-pom hair uh, bobbles up here, <laughs> I can't think of the correct phrase, she had an ethereal quality to her that kind of reflected this fabric. Um, but all my etchings, they all have one thing about them, that everything that's in them is something I've seen or drawn in my sketchbook. And I quite like cherry picking items from my sketchbooks from recent weeks or days and placing them together, even though it might appear rather disparate. So this figure here was somebody I drew um, last year, at the beginning of all the uh, Remain uh, protest rallies, who, you know, every, all the people who wanted to stay in the European Union and not to leave. And she was a member of a group who stood up and sa was saying, me too, I, want, I agree with that, during a vote. And there's something about her enthusiasm and the fact that, as a grown adult, she still put her hand up, rather like in the classroom. And I've used her a lot in some of my etchings, so there she is, and here she is on the plate. And I draw these freehand, I don't um, trace them. And as I said before, I do draw them just directly as I envisage them, and I'm happy for the process to reverse it uh, at the end. Uh, and then finally I was thinking, oh, this is all a bit like juggling with images, and um, I need something down here. I had been drawing some other dancers wearing masks, but I didn't quite, I wasn't happy with them there until um, I, I saw some sea lions training to do with another project I'm working on. And I quite like this wonderful sea lion here who just fits in down here and he's juggling too. And, and this sort of juggling with imagery and the, the movement and the disparate nature of things and people and animals I've seen in the last few weeks it sort of made sense to me. It perhaps won't make sense to anybody else, but that's what I like to do, is to have a uh, curiosity involved in my images. And they all rely on drawing, so I don't use photography, I don't use photo etching. It's very, very traditional techniques that I use. So now I'm, I'm just adding a little bit to the drawing and checking that this pen I'm using, of course, isn't a real pen, it's a metal. It's a metal pen, and it's quite an old one. It has a very good little sharp point on it. I have one or two other ones, but as I bought, and are more recent, but to be honest, they're just not as good as this one. I find the very new ones, they tend to stick in the surface of the zinc. And this one just draws quite nice thicker lines if I want it to, or much more delicate lines. So if you're a drawer, like me, etching is a perfect vehicle for you if you want to do printmaking, because um, as far as I'm concerned it's the perfect medium for drawing. And it has, as all printmaking does, um, the element of surprise, because even the artist can't totally control what the chemicals are going to do at the final stages. And so that element of surprise is great and it sort of stops you being too careful. I'm not being too accurate with the direction of some of these lines because the fabric to trying to depict here was so kind of diaphanous that it wasn't precise anyway. And the other important thing 
about this process is that you'll notice I'm not I'm not gouging out. I'm literally just gently using it as one would use a very sharp pencil point. You don't need to gouge it. It's not that sort of process. Uh, if you get the wax on too thickly, then it will kind of make some slightly uneven um, lines because uh, the thicker wax will come off in, in bigger globules. So it's always important to have a thin film of wax if you're doing detailed drawings. There is another uh, wax you can use or ground called soft ground which is more useful if you want to um, press in a, a texture of some sort. So you might have uh, some mesh for example that you want to maybe put into a fabric area like this and then you'd put the soft ground onto it. Press the mesh into the soft ground by passing it through the press and when you remove the mesh you would have an impression of where that uh, fabric textile was and that will give you a, a good sort of textural quality if particularly if you're doing an abstract imagery it's very helpful but um, I very rarely use it really um, I have used it occasionally in the past but I just like drawing with with my line and my pen my uh, metal pen so I'm not terribly experimental although I will be in a bit later with the aquatint and this paper brush Before my plate goes into the acid and is ready for inking up, um, it's important that the paper I'm going to use, even for proofing, is uh, dampened. So it's been sitting in a bath of water. Let's stick it on there for a minute. Some of it, you see this one's a bit of a dirty sheet, but it's all right on the other side. And, and for proofing, that's taking the first proof off a plate to see how it's uh, come out of the acid. It's better to use some older paper. And what I'm going to do with these sheets is, once the initial water dripped off, is put them between some sheets of blotting paper so that when I need them, they'll be just damp but not wet. So I'm going to carry these over now to the sheets of blotting paper. And you can, I love it when you can see the watermark across the top of the paper. Printmaking paper is always well, for etching anyway, and for intaglio purposes, quite thick, uh, 250 to 300 grams weight, because it has to be able to withstand the press and the pressure it's about to be subjected to. So, one by one, so I've got enough blotting out here. So I'll put the what's it is later when my hands are dirty and I'm using the ink, I'll be handling the paper with little uh, paper folded paper pick up pieces so that I don't transfer any um, ink onto the clean paper. So I'm just going to get another sheet of blotting to put on the top of that and then we'll prepare the plate for the acid. So the plate is now more or less ready to go into the acid. I have these dark black marks are a straw hat varnish which is a dark varnish traditionally used on straw hats, but it has um, a sort of black dye in it that uh, means that you can see where you've been. And in fact, I just spotted there's a bit I haven't covered at the top there. But this protects the plate um, from any um, foul bite, i.e. where the acid might bite where you don't want it to. Um, this is the straw hat varnish. It's sort of thick, gloopy stuff. I'm just going to paint around this edge 
so that the edge of the plate doesn't get bitten into because that would then or could again tear the paper it dries very quickly and traditionally you would cover the, the back of your plate with the varnish but nowadays you can buy plates ready coated on the back which is good and time consuming and saves wasting time but it's do a good job going on these edges but it's, this is an important process and something that will impact on your image if, you don't, if you're not careful. So we'll just give that a couple of seconds to dry before it goes into the acid. Now the acid is nitric. The acid I'm going to use is diluted about 10 parts of water to one of nitric. Um, I put it in a developing tray, which you'll see in a minute, and sit that developing tray inside a larger one that's got warm water in it. The reason I do that is that if the acid's really cold when it comes out of storage, it doesn't bite quite as efficiently. Oh, that's what I find, anyway. And you don't want a ragged bite going down into the plate. You want it to bite smoothly in a, uh, an efficient, sharp way. Uh, right, so I think this is probably ready now. <coughs> What I need is, uh, this is a dangerous bit, I put, use a phone as a timer. <laughs> and I'm always worried about it dropping into the acid. So hopefully that won't happen. Let's see. Turn, no, I don't want to turn my stopwatch. So I put the phone up here. That's a great thing for having a rubber cover on your phone. It's less likely to slip into an acid bath. Which is, not very helpful. This should be dry now. So I'm about to put it into the acid bath. And before I do that, press this switch here and the fan, the extract fan, will start. And what you don't want to do is be breathing in any fumes. So I'll put it in the bottle first. And instantly you can see how the lines show up where the drawing is. Start and, and I usually have this in the bath, oh it could be up to 10 minutes, so you won't want to be watching this for whole 10 minutes, but you see here I have a feather, and sometimes when the acid is burning overactively it can form bubbles on the lines that you've drawn and if that happens it will stop the acid biting quite as you want it to. At the moment it looks okay but some of this area here where there's a lot of cross hatching shortly I will probably have to just pass the feather over it. There are areas that have got quite well bitten now um, it's quite shiny, it's often so So then you have to get it out of the acid and be quite careful. So put that brush in the water. This is what acid drip back, and then what I'm going to do is put it into the water bath over there. Like developing a photo, you know, you want to stop the process. And actually, now it's been in the acid, the metal shines through much more brightly than before it was etched. It was more subtle presence before it went into the acid bath. So I'm going to take my gloves off in a minute and just feel my fingertips if everything is bitten and then I will take the wax surface off the plate and we'll see what it looks like then. 
Oh, it's a bit of a nightmare in case you missed something critical. <laughs> so we fan running an extraction fan, just so that we've got a window open here as well, so we don't asphyxiate ourselves. Um, so this is the moment of truth. Lots of white spirit. I never tested it late in the day now, but yep, that has bitten. Good old fingernail. Sorry about that. I said I was going to do it and then I didn't. Oh, you can see the image on that plate that was so clean before it's revealing itself. The black blob are uh, where I put the straw hat varnish and I will have to remove those with methylated spirits just because it needs a different solvent but we can see that the drawing is there even the faintest lines it's a magical thing when processes like this would work we reveal what they've done and whether the chemicals have worked or not, or whether the chemicals have gone off. There's so many variables that can take place in printmaking, but I think that's what makes this exciting. Just to dry cloth. So always keep your old t shirts if you're a printmaker because that's what makes good cotton. Right. So I think that's looking pretty good. Now I'm just going to put it on the hot plate to dry. So just over here, in my hot plate, is something called an Echo Hostess. <laughs> and it belonged to a friend of ours. And it had been her wedding present, they'd never used it. So I bought it from her years ago for £25. And it's really and it's cheap. So I'll just wait for that to dry. And then I'll get out the inks. So we'll make a proof. <laughs> 